Today, a special Trek Zone conversation with Frank DeMauro and Kurt Eberly, Vice President of Northrop Grumman, who are eagerly awaiting the launch this weekend of their new Antares rocket and Cygnus capsule. Now, in its seventh year of podcasting, Trek Zone presents a Trek Zone conversation with your host, Matt Miller. Welcome to a Trek Zone Conversation. I'm very excited today to be uh, hooking up with Northrop Grumman uh, in the US. They're just about to launch uh, Antares and Cygnus to the International Space Station. I'm now joined by Kurt and Frank uh, from over there. Gentlemen, thanks so much for your time today. Uh, our pleasure. Glad to be here. Kurt, firstly with you, uh, with Antares the rocket, uh, can you tell us a little bit about it? Absolutely. Yeah, Antares is uh, what we would call a medium-class rocket, and uh, the first stage is liquid-powered. It uses uh, kerosene as a fuel and liquid oxygen as the oxidizer. And the second stage is a solid uh, rocket motor called the Castor 30 XL. And uh, we carry our mission that we're talking about today is uh, carrying Cygnus into low Earth orbit and uh, dropping them off so that they can do uh, the rest of the mission of carrying the cargo to the space station. So uh, so it's the single use, and the uh, after the, stages, the first stage is burned out, then uh, it separates, and then the second stage ignites and uh, carries the Cygnus uh, into orbit from there. Fantastic. Well, Frank, on Cygnus, uh, it's uh, obviously a, a resupply craft uh, for the International Space Station. Um, What's its sort of what's its carrying capacity and and is this its general day to day mission as it were? Yeah, so uh, carrying capacity we we can take up about thirty seven hundred and fifty kilograms of cargo. Uh, as part of that cargo, we also carry a lot of science experiments. We actually carry uh, live rodents as part of our cargo, uh, oh, wow. and we carry uh, powered payloads. So we we those get loaded into the vehicle, and we provide power and telemetry and commanding of that. Of, uh, of those experiments. Uh, that all gets loaded on the ground here at Wallops. We, we put the final cargo in about uh, 24 hours before launch with a system that was developed between the Antares and Cygnus team. And then once uh, Antares puts us into orbit, uh, Cygnus will take it the rest of the way autonomously from uh, about a couple hundred kilometer altitude to the 400 kilometer altitude of the ISS where it autonomously berths with the ISS. It'll uh, get grappled by the crew once we get there. Uh, and then it stays on the ISS um, three months or longer, as we've demonstrated. And then we also perform a very critical task where the crew will pack us full of the trash that they don't want to have anymore on the ISS. We'll take that away, and uh, we burn up in the atmosphere uh, with that trash uh, in the cargo module. That is very cool. Well, Cygnus is, as we're talking about, getting the lift into space this weekend, and, and as you said, carrying just shy of four tons of supply and hardware. How does it all fit inside uh, the capsule? <laughs> well, we, we have a we have a pretty pretty good sized pressurized module. We call it a pressurized cargo module. Uh, it, it it is pretty big in there, and we have optimized the packing of the cargo in conjunction with with NASA's cargo team to figure out the most efficient way to pack it in there. Most of the cargo gets delivered to us in in special bags. We call cargo transfer bags, uh, and then our team. Uh, NASA will tell us how many bags, how big they're going to be, how heavy they're going to be, and then our engineers figure out the most efficient way to pack them. Uh, and then once those are delivered, we follow through in that plan, and they're packed in all sorts of nooks, nooks and crannies in the cargo module. Uh, they're strapped down. Uh, we provide uh, airflow to keep it cool in there and thermal control for the powered payloads. So it's we've learned over the missions, this will be our 12th mission to the ISS, we've learned uh, through that process, we've optimized it a few times along the way uh, to maximize just how much we can carry. So there's some very good Tetris players on your team. That, that is exactly the way to think of it, exactly. <laughs> well, I'm loving the fact that uh, as part of this payload uh, this weekend is a zero-G oven uh, for the astronauts to bake in space for the first time. Uh, so it's a, a, it's a pretty uh, critical launch that we've got uh, happening this weekend, isn't it? It, it is. You know, we, we look at all of these missions individually. Of course, we've done it several times, and every mission is special. Every mission uh, takes the tremendous attention by the Antares team and the Cygnus team to get it right. We do many reviews uh, to make sure everyone's comfortable, that the vehicles are healthy and ready to go. 
So uh, th these are these missions are critical for uh, for NASA for our customer. They are very critical for the crew on board the ISS and for the folks that are sending science that's uh, going to take place on the ISS. Well, a question for both of you: um, Fifty years ago, the launch to space was very much a, a government industry thing with NASA and and Roscosmos. Uh, is it better these days with many companies aiming to reach orbit and and beyond? Is it sort of a little bit of a different space race, if you will? Yeah, I, I think it's absolutely different. And I think it's absolutely better. Uh, you know, the predecessor company that uh, that I started working for in 1991 was uh, Orbital Sciences Corporation, and uh, Orbital Sciences was the first developer of a privately developed rocket uh, called Pegasus, uh, which flew for the first time in 1990 and just had a successful launch for NASA to earlier this month uh, from Florida, the ICON mission. So, uh, so you know, I think bringing private investment and entrepreneurial entrepreneurship to the uh, space launch business has been has just accelerated innovation and it's also brought down uh, the cost of access to space for all the users including government users um, you know and I think uh, on this particular project back in 2007 we were awarded the COTS uh, Space Act agreement that's a commercial orbital transportation services so that was really NASA's attempt to prepare for the post-shuttle era and uh, get uh, private industry to develop the capability to do cargo delivery to the space station commercially. Uh, so, you know, that was, I think, from that start uh, in 2007, look at where we are now. You know, this is the 12th uh, cargo delivery mission, and uh, we've delivered a lot of cargo, and, and NASA doesn't have to, and they basically outsourced their logistics in terms of carrying cargo uh, to the space station. So I, I think it's been a huge success. Uh, just in this particular program in terms of uh, developing the commercial capability and then uh, allowing NASA to take advantage of that commercial capability. And, and the, the, just one thing to add to that as part of the, the COTS program that, that Kurt talked about, while we were awarded the COTS uh, program, it was actually, we, we were, NASA was less of a customer and more of a partner where we both invested in developing the capability of getting this cargo to the ISS. And the contract isn't where NASA is buying a spacecraft, they're buying a service. So we provide a logistics service. Uh, it's, it's our rocket, it's our spacecraft, and then NASA pays us to perform the service. So it's, a, it's been a great partnership. NASA's been a great customer and partner in that whole thing. Uh, and it's been a, a, a successful uh, business venture as well. Well, SpaceX, Amazon, you guys at, at Northrop Grumman uh, all have slightly different objectives in, in getting to space, in, in what you guys are doing, space in, in what you guys are doing, which is essentially defining uh, the huge workload of maintaining crewed space flight uh, as we move towards Artemis and onto Mars. Does this allow for better, more adapted technologies for each mission do you think well i, I think it, it does if you look at the cargo services contracts that are out there the the service that we perform and the service that spacex performs is actually pretty different uh, we both send up car cargo that's in a pressurized volume we send up a, a, a bigger load of cargo than spacex does but then they provide the capability to return some of that cargo to the ground mainly science experiments that can be delivered to NASA for further study. Uh, so the, because their requirement was for the return capability, they designed their system to focus on that capability. Because our uh, focus was on pressurized up mass and pressurized disposal, we optimized our system for that capability. So by having multiple partners, I think they can play complementary roles in providing NASA the services that they need. Yeah, you know, I'd also add that uh, in the 19 years that uh, that that uh, astronauts have been continuously occupying the International Space Station, you know, NASA's really learned a lot about how to have humans live and work comfortably in space. And they've developed the methods for feeding the astronauts, how to pack the food, how to store it, uh, how to transport it. Uh, same with experiments. And uh, you know, right now their focus is on using the ISS to conduct experiments on a lot of life sciences research on how can humans uh, survive that trip to Mars and, and to the moon? Uh, so, so that's very critical. And, and this laboratory, you know, in the course of operating it for 19 years, they've certainly learned a lot about uh, what's important for humans to be uh, living and operating in space. Well, I want to take you guys back just to touch on it uh, briefly to October 2014, the, the fifth launch of Antares. Unfortunately, uh, it was destroyed and that's not the greatest feeling. But how do you go about learning from the, learning the mistakes and, and fixing them? Yeah, absolutely. You know, anytime we uh, we lose a mission, it's a it's a real uh, gut punch. You know, I've been a few through a few of these in my in my career, and uh, it's never an enjoyable time. But it's also 
a time uh, uh, where you, you end up learning a lot in the course of the investigation uh, because you pick through all the data and you work through the investigation and return to flight. So it was an unfortunate event, but you know we, we've basically gone to the next uh, configuration and we've flown five missions successfully since then with, uh, with new main engines, the RD-181s, and it's all been, uh, those have worked uh, extremely well and we're really happy with the performance uh, on these last five missions and uh, expect to continue that into the future. Well, this weekend, as we've touched on, uh, it's an upgraded Antares set to launch with the new Cygnus to the space station. What does this latest model do differently to previous designs? The most important thing is we're we're increasing the mass to orbit capability of Antares. So we can carry more mass to orbit and that's going to allow Cygnus to get their job done and meet the uh, the Cirrus 2 requirements. Uh, and the way we do that is uh, we have a structurally enhanced first stage core that allows us to fly the RD-181 engines, the main engines, at 100% throttle for most of the first stage burn. That's the biggest increase in the mass to orbit. And then we have some other optimizations where we've lightened up the first stage and we've lightened up the second stage and we've consolidated some of the composite structures uh, on the upper stack. And uh, that has allowed us to carry the, uh, the increased mass uh, of about uh, 800 kilograms uh, over the prior configuration uh, to orbit. The other things we're bringing forward is a removable nose cone on the fairing, the payload fairing, that allows access to the Cygnus hatch to load cargo at 24 hours before liftoff. That's something we actually debuted on the prior mission, the NG-11 mission back in April, and it worked very well. So that removable nose cone is removed even as we speak right now, and, uh, and then just tomorrow, Cygnus and NASA will be loading the final cargo complement into Cygnus uh, tomorrow morning. And then we have the, uh, we've got the facility, a mobile clean room over the front of Antares that allows that to happen in an environmentally controlled area. And then we've developed the capability that once that cargo is loaded, we close everything up, go back vertical, and prepare for launch uh, the next day. So we basically crisped up the timeline and uh, developed the ground support that enables that, uh, that timeline to work. And then the final thing we've done is we've uh, changed the way uh, the guidance works on Antares to allow the cargo to be varied by up to 20% mass uh, as late as 24 hours before liftoff. So that just allows NASA more flexibility in their cargo manifesting, you know, for late-breaking developments on the station or late-breaking developments with their cargo where they may need to uh, remove or add something at the last minute. So this adaptive guidance uh, on Antares allows, uh, allows the operator on, uh, on the day of launch during the countdown, we upload that final mass and then the guidance adapts and uh, flies the proper trajectory. Frank, for Cygnus, what, what does that mean for your customer at NASA and, and um, being able to access Cygnus pretty much right up until launch? That's a, that's a critical capability. If we look back in, in our history, the, the first couple of Cygnus vehicles were really cargo delivery spacecraft and that was very important uh, capability to deliver. But over time, we've continuously upgraded the spacecraft and always pushed it to be more and more science friendly, as we call it, so where we could support not only delivering cargo to the ISS, but delivering science to the cargo and supporting the scientists themselves. So uh, in addition to the to the mass increase that Antares is, is able to provide, so we, we use that to obviously put more cargo in the vehicle, but we also put more science specific cargo in the spacecraft. So for instance, there are these types of uh, uh, of, of cargo holders called mid-deck lockers that get loaded during that late, that final load period, that, that 24 hours before launch, that really do carry the time-sensitive cargo to the ISS. And so the idea there is if by having the ability to load that as late as possible, then we can minimize the time from when it's delivered to us to the time that we deliver it to the ISS. The other thing we've done is increase the number of those lockers that we can provide power to so they can have uh, coolers on board, or they can actually be running experiments while we're uh, in orbit before we get to the ISS. And we've also increased the capability for the scientists to actually talk to those experiments while we're flying. Oh, wow. So we can get telemetry and we can command them. Uh, and that's that's a capability that the scientists have really, really enjoyed. And then it, to support all that, we've actually uh, installed uh, some science laboratories right here at Wallops, very close to the pad, for the scientists to work and prep their uh, prep the cargo. We have a facility not too far away, a couple of hours drive at a, at a, a medical school in Norfolk, Virginia, where they can 
where they can process the uh, the live cargo, the rodents, before delivered to the to the launch site. And then we've also offered uh, we've given NASA the capability for not only putting disposal cargo inside the the vehicle, but for them to install some disposal cargo on the outside of the vehicle for us to uh, for us to take down with us. So there, there's really been a, a big push on this latest upgrade of the vehicle to be more more and more science friendly give them as much information as they can along the way and really help nasa with their with their logistics of operating the space station fantastic gentlemen well thank you so much for having a chat today good luck on launch day uh and can't wait to see antares and cygnus fly all right well thanks very much great right, to talk with you you can get social with trek zone australia's unofficial home of star trek is everywhere you are get the wrap up on our facebook page keep in the loop on twitter and relive trek episodes on instagram just search for trek zone